to be a judge or an arbiter between you. Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Children's Church. And I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on, a glorious light beyond all compare. And there will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, we'll live to know you here on this earth. They didn't know what I was going to preach about when they picked out the song, but that is so, so perfect. Because we're looking at the future, our retirement, what's in store for us. And there's something so much more in store for the body of Christ, for the believers, than there are for the rest of the world, the hope that we have. Just, just ponder on that while I open us up in prayer. Father, we are just so amazed that your ways are so perfect and true. Father, forgive us for our sins, our departure from your ways. You created us to be in a relationship with you, and you restored us at the price of the blood of your Son. What a loving, faithful God. All the times that we rebelled against you and turned our backs from you and wanted to go our own ways and placed our own selves up above you on a throne, you continue to be faithful and true. And what you have in store for us is just beyond any type of imagination. But today we'll look at that, Lord, and we pray that we're not like this foolish man, that we don't worry about the things of this world, but bring glory and honor to you because you are the one that deserves all praise, all honor. You are an awesome, amazing God, and we love you, and we thank you that because of the death of Jesus Christ, because of His humble sacrifice, and the, and the blessing of your Spirit, that we are sons and daughters of the Most High. We just thank you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I entitled this Sound Retirement Planning. Okay, does anybody like that kind of advice? Because I'm going I'm to teach you a little bit today, I hope, and we'll learn something. So let's start with Luke 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, or the King James Version says, Master, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now I don't know what you think, but I think at this point Jesus was thinking to himself, Really? All the things I've been teaching and saying, and this guy just blurts out, Give me what's not even mine. Because his inheritance, if his brother had it, that means his brother was the older of the two. And he was supposed to get his part after that. The first brother would get twice as much as the second brother. And if there were several children, they would have to divide it that way. So the man's claim was not even legitimate. It was foolish. And he blurted out in the middle of what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples to learn because he would soon be going to his death to complete the mission that God the Father sent him for. He had already taught his first point to be on guard, and we saw the second one here, that he was supposed to be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So there is a problem that we have that we wear a mask, that we don't truly say who we are because our hearts are not close to God, they're far from God. Maybe our head knowledge is there, but our hearts don't realize what God has done for us, how much He loves us, what the cost was to restore us back, and what awaits us in our future. Instead, we focus on the things of this world and how we're going to build up our treasures here on earth and how we're going to be okay in our retirement time. When if it wasn't God giving us oxygen each morning when we get up, we wouldn't be able to even live, would we? It's by the grace of God that we have all things. By the grace of God that we are here in a free country. By the grace of God that we're not being persecuted right now for praising His name. 
So we try to continue to build up treasures on this earth. And Jesus looks at this guy and, and his answer is quite clear because he just calls him man. He doesn't even relate to him. He tells him that he's a human being, but no more than that because he's not getting the concept. He was telling him he was an idiot. Maybe you don't like that word, so I'll give you a synonym for idiot. We'll see if you like those any better. The, David said it when he said it was the parable of the rich fool coming up. A synonym for idiot is fool, half-wit, dunce, dolt, ignoramus, cretin, moron, imbecile, simpleton. This man had no clue whatsoever. He lacked the knowledge of what God was doing through Jesus Christ. He had seen all the miracles. He had seen the things that Jesus had done. He had heard the teachings. And what he was worried about instead was, Give me what's not even mine, but I want it anyway. I, I, I'm not concerned about what you're saying, Jesus. I'm concerned about me, myself, and I. That Trinity. Not the Holy Trinity. So Jesus did reply, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator between you? Or arbiter between you? He recognized him, but that's about all he did. And then he goes on to tell a parable. But we're not going to get to the parable today. We are going to get a couple of teaching examples from Alan, not from Jesus. We'll get into that. And we'll see if you remember them. Because do you remember what prop I used last week for our paraclete? What I use? A parakeet. Right there it is. See, you remember that. So we're going to try to use some of that so you'll think about what your future retirement is. Jesus' reply was cold and indifferent to the man because he had no clue whatsoever. He had put himself out there to the reasoning of a fool, one who doesn't fear God and has no understanding of God. His argument was not even valid. It was a rude interruption. He would have known, he would have been a follower of Jesus at this point. He would have known the Old Testament law, and in Deuteronomy 21, 17, he would have known that it said, He must acknowledge the son of his unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double share of all he has. The son is the first sign of his father's strength. The right of the firstborn belongs to him. So he had no claim. He had no claim whatsoever to call out to Jesus. It was a rude interruption and not a valid claim at all. It simply said, I want, I need, therefore I am. Not to understand at all that the Messiah was standing there before him. Not the judge of the world at this time, praise God, thank goodness. But the Messiah, the Savior of the world, stood before him with convincing proofs and yet he didn't want to hear what was being said. Maybe if he'd have understood his, new, his Ten Commandments better, he would have known these things. What are the Ten Commandments? Can you say them? I'm not putting you on the spot. Let's go to Exodus 20 and we'll read them together. Because if you get, and you maybe you'll understand this when we get through it, if you get commandment number one, guess what? The others will come, won't they? But you know, it's ironic. If you get commandment number ten, which he was guilty of, the other ones will come if you go backwards also. Because the first commandment is to have no other gods before me. And the tenth commandment is thou shalt not covet. If you know that God is God and everything else, you'll never covet. You'll get to that point. If you don't covet, you'll be loving your neighbor and you won't care. And you'll know that's because that God reigns supreme. That He loves you, that He's in control of all things. So in Exodus 20, verse 1, we read, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God. See, there's the beginning of understanding. The fear of God, acknowledging who He is, is the beginning of all wisdom. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, you shall not make for yourself any image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth, beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Now, get the key here, because so many Christians don't understand this. That's of those who hate me. Don't worry about those things. Because if you love the Lord, you don't have to worry about it. Train up your children, they will not depart from it. Thank you, David, for the impromptu reading of Scripture. Because he's brought up that way and he had no problem. Even over his dad saying, hmm, I don't know if I want to or not. The son stepped up because of his training and read Scripture that he was not prepared to read. He was simply asked to read when we were introducing ourselves to each other. And I think sometimes David kind of avoids me for that reason. But thank you for that, David. I appreciate that so much. Verse 6, But showing love to a thousands, 
to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Remember that verse. Third, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses His name. Fourth, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreign, foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and, the, all, of the, and all that is in them. But He rested on the seventh day, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy." Now you may not realize it, but we have the ultimate Sabbath day ahead of us as Christians. Eternal rest because of what God did through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what we are living for. Not this earth, but what we have eternally in heaven. Five, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land, of the, the, land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. Number what, six. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male and female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This guy didn't get the Ten Commandments. He didn't get that the Lord was his God and not to have any other gods before him. He surely didn't get the fact that he shouldn't covet. He said, teacher, master, I notice your power and your wisdom and your might. So tell my brother to do this. Not relevant at all to Jesus' teaching. A very rude interruption that had no comprehension of what was going on out there in the spiritual realm. It was just focused right here on today, me, now, what I want. <clears throat> Knowing God... Verse 2 started out and said, I am the Lord your God. That is the beginning. If you realize that, then you won't have the problems with the other things. Will you sin? Yes. You probably will. But John says, I've taught you, told you these things so that you will not sin. You don't have to. You have the power of God inside of you. But we still struggle. We still fight with that. But if you know that God is who He says He is, that He's in control, that through Jesus Christ He no longer sees your sin and shame, but sees Jesus' righteousness and what you have in store for all of eternity. It will make all the difference in the world. You won't be like this man. Paul said it this way in Romans 7, verses 7 8. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would have not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. We fight a sinful nature. We are the ones who rebelled against God and have lived in a fallen creation. Does that mean we can't enjoy this life? Not at all. Does it mean that we can't have things? Not at all. There are plenty of people that have plenty of wealth in the Bible. What it means is that you don't have other gods before Him. What it means is that you're focused on the spiritual, the everlasting, rather than the, the temporal of this world, the filth, the nastiness. Paul later goes on to explain in Romans 13, verses 8 through 10, Let no debt remain outstanding, except, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, and you shall not covet. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Do you think if he understood that, he would have been worried about what his brother got? Or he would have been thankful for what his brother got? His brother was the firstborn who was entitled to these things. And it was his brother. It reminds me of the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son, not really the one that had the problem in that story. It was the other brother who wouldn't accept that, that son coming back home. Because the father had to proclaim, I'm thankful we've got to celebrate. We've got to celebrate. Because our son, the son that was lost is now found. He's back home. And see, each and every one of us have been lost. And hopefully you've been found through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
And when we get to heaven, it's going to be a celebration that never ends. You might hear people say, well, I don't know about heaven. I don't know if I want to be there because I'll get bored. <laughs> it's going to be one continuous celebration. Their thoughts are like this guy. I'd rather party in hell with my friends. No, you won't. And the party won't be any comparison. We are God's children. We inherit God Almighty, what He owns. And He owns everything, does He not? And He's going to restore everything and make everything perfect for us. That's what we are working for. That's what we will get as inheritance for being God's children. Paul was basically saying just what Jesus said in Matthew 22, verse 36 through 40. When the teachers and experts of the law tried to confuse Jesus and trap Him, and His answer back to what is the greatest commandment is this. Um, the question was asked in verse 36, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Surely Jesus will trip up on this, right? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Not part of those, not one out of those, but all of those. Every bit of your being. This is the first and greatest command. And if you have that down pat, then the second command is like it, and it will be a lot easier. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't covet what they have. Don't want to murder. Don't have greed or envy or anything else. But love them. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. That we love one another. So that we understand it. So that we're not like this idiot who yelled out from the crowd and interrupted what Jesus had to say. But we get a good parable out of it coming up and you'll get two sermons out of it because you'll get that one next week probably. Man is how Jesus referred to this guy. Because he didn't understand anything. He didn't understand the first commandment. He didn't understand the tenth commandment. He didn't understand the Savior of the world stood before him. He didn't know God. He said he did. He was there. He had followed Jesus from wherever it was and come out to see him. But he came to see him for what he could get out of that relationship. Not understanding that in that relationship he would get everything for eternity. But I've got to quit focusing on today if I'm going to see that. Paul also said in Romans ch chapter 2 starting in verse 1, You therefore have no excuse. And this is how that man stood before Jesus, with no excuse whatsoever. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who does, do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, or man, as Jesus referred to him, pass judgment on them, because your brother has more than you do, and yet you do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Because see, also as God's children, we have no fear of judgment. We have no fear of death. Because like I preached last week, because of the Holy Spirit as our advocate, and because of Jesus as our advocate, they're telling us to plead not guilty before God Almighty because our sins have been covered. We have an adoption certificate saying that we belong to God. Verse 4, Do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance, that you change your thought process, you change your mind. For once I lived for myself, but now I realize that Jesus Christ came and He died for me. Therefore, my life is not my own. It is His and I live for Him. But because of your stubbornness, verse 5, and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself in the day of God's wrath. So building up these treasures on earth is only storing up wrath for you if your focus is on building those treasures. When His righteous judgment will be revealed, God will repay each person according to what they have done. Jesus went on to say to the man, Who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? I don't think the man understood what Jesus was saying at all, but he was saying, You should be so thankful to God right now. You should repent right this second, because what I just said right here, I am not here as your judge and arbiter today. I am here as a Savior that stands before you. Not to condemn you, 
but to offer you righteousness, to offer you eternal life. In John, it's recorded this way in John three sixteen through 19. For God so loved the world that He gave His only one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, to be the judge, but to save the world through Him. Just think what this man is facing this day and doesn't have a clue. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. How is the light that's in you? We've already studied that from Luke. That it's not a problem with the light, it's a problem with your eye if you're not perceiving it correctly. And the light that Jesus has should be the light that you have and it should shine so that others will see that. Jesus continued in Luke 12 and verse 15. He said, watch out. So you get this exclamation at first saying, listen up, hello, hey, you man who's an idiot or fool. Be on your guard against all kind of greed. But notice he said this to them in Luke 12. He didn't say this just to this man. Why? Because in our hearts we do the same thing. And you know, I know I've done it. You probably know that you've done it. Where I've said, well, they don't deserve this or that. And then I got humbled to my knees because the Spirit is inside of me and said, thank you for the grace, the mercy and grace that you've given to me. I didn't deserve anything except eternal damnation. But instead, Jesus offered me life. How can I ever, ever look at my fellow man and, and say in that state, why does he deserve this or that? Because he deserves nothing but hell, but God offers him nothing but life through Jesus Christ. If you have accepted that, you know that. So be on your guard against all kind of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Watch out. Remember the Tenth Commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So why do we? We need to go back to that First Commandment and say to love the Lord your God. As Jesus said, to love Him with all of your heart, all of your soul. So have you read John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress for? Maybe. Most of you have. It's been a long time. Do you remember the muck rake? What is a muck rake? Prop number one. <laughs> this is a muck rake, at least in today's world. What do you do with a muck rake? You shovel poop. <laughs> you shovel poop out of the horse's pen. So they're not eating and stepping and getting it everywhere. Okay? So you get it out of the pen so it's not in there with it. But in Pilgrim's Progress, the man was sitting there raking the muck and would never ever look up to see that he was being offered an eternal crown that was sitting right there above his head, but he would never take his eyes off of this because he was fixed on this world doing what he thought he needed to be doing, which is raking crap. That's what he's doing. Not realizing that any treasure that's on here, whether there's a million dollars on this floor, it means nothing compared to what's being offered to you by God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We've got to get that mindset so that we don't worry about the things of this earth. It doesn't matter if you have abundance or if you have not. Paul taught us that. He said that he was content no matter what the circumstances were. Even whether he was in prison, in persecution, or he was free. His focus was on spreading the gospel message of Jesus Christ because it was the power of salvation to those who believe. I don't want to be guilty of that, but I know that so many times I am guilty of that. So I ask forgiveness, I ask for guidance, I ask for the power of the Spirit to lead me through that. To walk by faith, not by sight. So that I don't keep my eyes focused on these things. So I don't worry about the things that this life has to offer. And that's what Jesus is going to go on to say in a couple different parables. He's first going to tell us that, that we can build up treasures here on earth, but we don't know that we have tomorrow. That all things are given, to, given from Him. He's going to tell us not to worry about anything. And He's going to tell us to be good stewards of what we have. That Jesus left this earth 
and put us in charge as ambassadors, as the light of the world, so that we will spread the gospel message. We have the privilege of doing that, the honor of doing that, so that others may come to know salvation through Jesus Christ. But we've got to get our eyes off the muck and the filth. We've got to look up to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, to look at what our eternal reward is. So when we're building sound retirement planning, I'm not talking about this world at all. I'm talking about our future in heaven. Okay, Retirement, we can get into that if you'd like to at some point, but if you're going to use this as a biblical principle, there's no real biblical principle for retirement. God will take care of His children. Don't worry about it. Worry about what He has in mind for you to be an ambassador, to be a light, to make a difference in this world because you have the keys to the kingdom in your hand as Henry preached on Friday. We have the keys to the kingdom of God in our hand. We've got to go out and offer them to people so that they will see our works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. So verse 15 said, Watch out. And he said this to all of them, Be on your guard against all kind of greed. But he finishes up with life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. So, so there's two thoughts there. One is to be on guard against greed. But even if you're not greedy, life is not about this world. It's not about the material things. It's not even about your health. It's not about your family even. Those are rewards from God. Children are a heritage from the Lord. And we should do everything we can to train them up so that they will not depart from Him. We should be an example. If we're saying one thing, but our lives doesn't back it up, what are we saying to our children? What are we saying to the world? But if they see that we're focused on eternal things, that we know that God is in control, that we do value what He did through Jesus Christ, then they're going to see the genuineness of our faith. And it will make a difference. So I started out by saying that this was silent retirement planning, right? And I'm going to prove that to you. Okay? Sweetheart, will you help me? Give everyone a penny. Okay? A penny. That's not much in this world, is it? What can a penny buy you nowadays? I don't think you can buy anything, can it? Well, if it's a current penny, can it buy anything nowadays? I mean, it used to buy stuff in a vending machine. I don't know if it can buy anything today. It's basically worthless, is it not? But see, that's what everything in this world is. We think that it has this value, but it does not. Okay? And I'm not saying that, like I said, that our children don't. I'm talking about focusing on that as your retirement, as your treasure. Don't take what I'm saying wrong. But if I gave you that penny, and I said I could tell you how to investment, and before I'm through preaching today, that penny could be worth $1 billion. Well, first of all, you'd say I was a quack, right? And many did call Jesus that, didn't they? You'd say, oh, I'm not going to believe in this. I'm not going to do what you ask. But if I could prove to you by the hand of God, by raising people from the dead even, that what I am telling you is true and that I have come to give you life, and life abundantly. But the only way to inherit the kingdom is to die and be reborn again by the Spirit. Will you take that penny and invest it? Because that penny can yield more than a billion dollars ever thought about in less of a time fraction than what you have here on earth. Because if you invest this before I get through speaking and you have a billion dollars when you walk out of here, that is nothing compared to eternity in the time factor. That is nothing compared to the rewards. Did everybody get a penny? Okay. You can do what you will with that penny. It can be a reminder, whatever. You can drop it in the offering plate. You can sit it there and remind you. But this world is a penny. The things of this world compared to that billion dollars that you're going to have for all eternity in heaven. And this is not a fair comparison, guys. Not even remotely. Because your life is like this to live for God compared to eternity. And all the riches that the most richest person has on this earth is but a penny compared to what it will be in heaven. Jesus goes on to say, What can a man give for his soul? You can't. But Jesus is offering you 
eternal peace, eternal salvation. Because He took all of the shame. He paid the price. He was obedient even unto death. He gave up heaven so that you might live today. So what I'm asking you is will you invest? Will you invest soundly in a retirement package that will pay off? That means investing your life, your heart, your mind, your body, and your soul, loving the Lord your God, not being like this man. And next week we'll look at what Jesus went on to say the parable. I gave you a couple of teaching illustrations today, so maybe you'll remember it. But don't waste your life. Live a life that brings glory and honor to God. Invest it soundly because you have eternity to reap those rewards. Father, we thank you so much that your ways are perfect, that you do own and are in control of everything, and that you have given it to us as children if we believe in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray here that everyone here knows you. If not, Father, I pray that they come to that knowledge today. I pray, Father, that we do repent of our ways, whether it's for salvation or just turning back to you. And realize that we do hold the keys to the kingdom in our hands. That we are your children. And that you have left us behind to show others the way. We thank you for the riches that you have given us through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you for the spirit that binds us together. For the time that we can be together here and worship and praise you. For you alone are worthy. We come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And through the power of your spirit as your children. In Jesus name we pray. Amen.